Welcome to NPTEL MOOCs course on Machine Learning and Deep Learning, Fundamentals and Application. In my last class, I discussed the concept of Bayesian Decision Theory. I explained the concept of the Bayesian Decision Theory for discrete features. After this, I discuss or I explain the concept of normal distribution. I have shown the expression for the normal distribution that is the Gaussian distribution and one is the univariate normal density and another one is the multivariate normal density. Today I will continue the same discussion. The concept is actually the Bayesian decision theory for normal distribution. So in this case you know in case of the Bayesian decision theory we have to consider the class conditional density that is the probability of x given omega i that is nothing but the likelihood or I can say it is a class conditional density. If the class conditional density follows normal distribution then what will be the nature of the decision boundary between the classes. So suppose if I consider large number of features corresponding to a particular class then this distribution the distribution is the probability of x given omega i that follows the normal distribution as per the central limit theorem and the, this concept is actually nothing but the supervised learning. So for each and every classes I have training samples, I have Fisher vectors and if I consider large number of Fisher vectors then this density the probability of x given omega i that is the class conditional density it follows normal distribution. So based on this the Bayesian decision theory for normal distribution I will explain what will be the nature of the decision boundary between the classes. So let us start the class. The class is the Bayesian decision theory for normal distribution. So in my last class I have shown the normal distribution. So if I consider the multivariate distribution that is I have two parameters one is the mean vector and another one is the covariance matrix. So corresponding to this my density the normal density that is the multivariate normal density is twice pi d by 2 and determinant of the covariance matrix we are considering an exponential minus 1 by 2 x minus here I can write x bar x minus mu transpose x minus mu. So this is the expression for the multivariate normal density. So for this what we have considered we are considering the d dimensional vector the vector is x. So if I consider this is the Fisher vector the d dimensional Fisher vector and this is my covariance matrix x expected value and x minus mu transpose. So this is my covariance matrix if I consider d is equal to 1 this is not a vector. So x is a random variable and corresponding to this I have the univariate density and in this case I have two parameters one is the mean another one is the variance. In case of the multivariate I have two parameters one is the mean vector and another one is the covariance matrix and yesterday in the last class I have shown the nature of the covariance matrix. The covariance matrix is like this sigma 1 square sigma 2 square like this I have the diagonal I have the diagonal elements like this and what are the off diagonal elements sigma 1 2 sigma 1 d sigma 2 1 sigma 2 d sigma d 1 sigma d 2 like this. So uh, this is the, the covariance matrix. So the diagonal elements are the variances of respective x i and the off diagonal elements are the covariance between x i and x j. 
so if i have only the diagonal elements suppose only i have the diagonal elements and suppose all the off diagonal elements these are zero so these are zeros suppose this is zero and all these elements are zero so that means xi and xj are statistically independent they are statistically independent so that is the case so that means the fisher vector if i consider x is a fisher vector the fissures are uncorrelated i am repeating this if i consider x is a fisher vector and x1 x2 xd these are the components of the fisher vector or i can say these are the elements of the fisher vector or i can say these are the fissures individual fissures x1 x2 these are the fissures so fissures will be uncorrelated if i have the diagonal covariance matrix the off diagonal elements are zero then in this case i can say xi and xj are statistically independent or i can say suppose if i consider the fisher vector that the fissures are uncorrelated and after this i discussed the concept of the mohalanobis distance so this is the distance root over x minus mu transpose so this is a famous distance and this distance is called the mohalanobis distance so later on i will explain the importance of this distance and if i consider suppose these are the samples some of the samples for a class suppose the class is omega 1 and these are the some samples for another class the class is suppose omega 2 so i have suppose two classes so the center of this particular cluster is determined by the mean the mean vector mu 1 and similarly the center or the centroid of the second class is mu 2 so center of the first class is mu 1 that is the mean and center of the second class is mu 2 so center of the cluster is determined by the mean vector and the shape of the cluster if you see the shape of this cluster the shape of the cluster is determined by the covariance matrix so last class i discussed about this concepts so this is the example of 2d gaussian so you can plot the 2d gaussian maybe in the matlab also you can plot so this is one example of the 2d gaussian now come to the main point the main point is the bayesian decision theory and i want to determine the decision surfaces that is the decision boundary between the classes so what will be the nature of the decision boundaries and in this case we are considering the class conditional density follows normal distribution so let us see the mathematical analysis for this decision boundaries the decision surfaces so let us move to the next slide so likelihood function what is the likelihood function the likelihood function is probability of x given omega i so this is the class conditional density and suppose this density it follows the normal density so it is suppose twice pi d by 2 and this is the covariance matrix for the class i class omega i 1 by 2 and exponential so we are considering a d dimensional fisher vector so this is the the density that is the class conditional density or maybe we can consider likelihood function omega i with respect to x so the class conditional density or the likelihood function it is a gaussian distribution and we are considering the c number of classes one two suppose c number of classes so in this case you, in this expression uh, we are considering the d dimensional fisher vector x is a d dimensional fisher vector x1 x2 xd so this is a fisher vector x and we are considering c number of classes so 
this is the covariance matrix this is a covariance matrix for the class omega i so what is actually this covariance matrix now this covariance matrix for the class omega i is nothing but the expected value x minus mu i x minus mu i transpose so you know how to determine this so i should write like this this is the actually for the class omega i and so that means actually there is a covariance matrix for the class omega i and what is the mean vector the mean also you can compute mean is nothing but the expected value of x the mean vector you can determine like this now let us consider the discriminate function what is the discriminate function discriminant function that is g i x is equal to l n so we know this expression this is the expression for the discriminant function so considering this because we have considered that this class conditional density or the likelihood function follows the normal distribution so based on this i can determine the discriminate function based on this condition so what will be the the discriminate function it is nothing but it is minus 1 by 2 x minus mu i transpose this is a covariance matrix for the class omega i plus ln plus ci ci is a constant suppose so let us consider this as equation number 1 what is actually ci ci is a constant so it is nothing but this d by 2 d by 2 ln twice pi minus 1 by 2 ln so this is ci so we can find the expression for the discriminate function you can see so from this actually from the expression from the class conditional density we can determine the discriminate function so let us move to the next slide so if i expand the previous equation expanding expanding the previous equation so you can see g i x i can write like this g i x is nothing but minus 1 by 2 x transpose So just you need to expand the previous equation and that is very simple. So this is suppose the equation number 2. So this is by expanding the previous equation. So here you can see we have a quadratic term here this is the quadratic term and this equation is nothing but nonlinear nonlinear quadratic quadratic form i can consider nonlinear quadratic form so we have the quadratic term is also there so uh, you can see this this term the first term is the quadratic term so suppose i can give one example suppose d is equal to 2 dimension is 2 then corresponding to this you can determine the covariance matrix 
the covariance matrix will be simply sigma i square 0 0 sigma i whole square this is the covariance matrix and from equation number 2 from equation number 2 I will be getting the discriminate function g i x is equal to minus 1 by 2 sigma i square x 1 plus x 1 square plus x 2 square plus 1 by sigma i square mu i 1 x 1 plus mu i 2 x 2 minus 1 by 2 sigma i square mu i 1 square plus mu i 2 square plus so I can write uh, this expression for the discriminate function so uh, this is corresponding to d is equal to 2 this is just an example so this expression number 2 is very important that is the expression for the discriminate function so I think uh, you should understand the equation number 2 the expression for the discriminate function for the class omega i so move to the next slide what is the decision boundary the decision curves decision curves g i x already you know that is the equation of the decision boundary g i x minus g j x is equal to 0. So, because we have the nonlinear quadratic equation that equation number 2 is the nonlinear quadratic form. So, this decision boundary will be quadrics quadric decision boundary maybe I can give some examples examples maybe uh, maybe we can consider suppose ellipsoid ellipsoid is one example of quadric decision boundary or maybe we can consider parabolas or maybe you can consider the hyper parabolas hyper hyper parabolas or maybe the pairs of lines maybe pairs of lines these are some examples of the decision boundary since the equation number 2 that is the equation for the discriminate function for the class omega i that is a nonlinear quadratic equation so this bayesian classifier is also called or also termed as the quadric classifier quadric classifier so this bayesian classifier you can call as or you can term as the quadric classifiers because of the equation number 2 so actually we are interested to find the decision boundary between the classes so if you see this decision curves that this is the equation of the decision boundary that is actually the partitioning partitioning of the fissure space Fisher space is the r to the power d space the d dimension space by quadric decision surfaces so partitioning of the fissure space by quadric decision surface that is the decision boundary so if i consider suppose that d is greater than 2 then decision surfaces decision surfaces are maybe the hyper quadrics if the dimension of the fissure vector is greater than 2 then decision surface are hyper quadrics so i can give some example of the quadric 
decision boundaries. So suppose this is a Fisher space. So maybe I can consider this is the decision boundary between the class omega 1 and omega 2. So it is a two dimensional Fisher space and we are considering the quadric decision curves. So quadric decision curves or maybe the boundaries. I can give another example. Suppose this is a Fisher space. And suppose I can consider this is a decision boundary, another boundary is something like this. And this is the class omega 1 and this is the class omega 2. And again suppose this is the class omega 1. So linear decision boundary is not possible in many cases. So we are considering the quadric decision curves. So these are some examples of the decision boundary. Now how to find the location of the decision boundary? So how to find the decision hyperplane? So that concept I am going to explain now. So how to determine and how to locate or how to fix the decision boundary between the classes. So let us move to the next slide. So the concept is the decision hyperplanes. Decision hyperplanes. So we have to determine the decision hyperplanes. So if you see the equation number 2, equation number 2, I am writing it again. So what is the equation number 2? g i x is equal to minus 1 by 2. So in the previous slide also, this expression I have shown. This is the expression for the discriminate function. So this is the equation number 2 that already I have explained. So in this equation, if you see the quadratic term, the quadratic term is x transpose, that is the inverse of the covariance matrix x. So this is the, the quadratic term in equation number 2. So this is the equation number 2. I have explained in the previous slide. This term is same for all the classes or for all the discriminate function. It is same for all the discriminant functions. So it is same for all the classes. So that means it has no role in classifications. So this term is not important. The same for all the discriminate functions. So it has no role in classification. Okay. So quadratic term will be same for all the discriminate functions and it has no role in classification. So now if I consider this one that is the covariance matrix of a particular class is equal to suppose covariance matrix sigma. So that means the covariance matrix is same for all the classes but it is arbitrary. So what is the meaning of this? The meaning is the covariance matrix covariance matrix is same for all the classes. but it is arbitrary. So covariance matrix is same for all the classes but it is arbitrary. So corresponding to this, this equation number 2 that is the discriminate function, I can write like this, that is 
W I transpose that is nothing but the weight vector x plus W I naught that is the bias. This is the bias. So I can consider as equation number suppose three. This is equation number three. And this W I and that is nothing but and this W I that is the weight vector. This is the weight vector. So this weight vector W i is nothing but sing the sigma inverse mu i. That is the weight vector W i. And what is the bias? Bias W i naught. So it is ln the prior probability minus one by two mu i transpose. mu i so i can write like i can write like this so if you see this equation if you see this one if you see this one g i x that is the discriminate function it is a linear function linear function of x and corresponding to this, corresponding to this, decision surfaces, are hyperplanes. The decision surfaces are hyperplanes. So, in this discussion, what we are considering, that the covariance matrix is same for all the classes. So, what are the things we are considering now? You can see here, this is important. The covariance matrix is same for all the classes, and it is arbitrary that we are considering. After this, from the equation number two, I can get this one. I can get this one. So I have the weight vector. The weight vector is W i, and that is nothing but this one. So from equation number two, I am getting equation number three, and in the equation number three, you can see I have the weight vector and the bias. Okay, so that from equation number two, I am getting equation number three, and in this calculation also you should remember that mu into the x t is equal to x mu t. So you have to apply this also to get this equation number three from equation number two. From equation number two, you can apply this one to get equation number three. From equation two to equation number three. So this is the general form of the discriminate function. This is a general from the discriminate function. So in my previous classes also I have shown this form. So this is the weight vector is W i, and also I have the bias. And I have shown that the decision surfaces. Or the decision boundaries are the hyperplanes. Now, I want to show, or I want to locate, or I want to fix the decision boundary between the classes. So let us see how we can do this. So let us move to the next slide. The case number one, I am considering. So in the case number one, we are considering this case diagonal covariance matrix. Diagonal covariance matrix with equal elements. So we are considering this case. That is the diagonal covariance matrix with equal elements. So what is the meaning of this? The meaning is this meaning actually. The Fisher vector. Fisher vector is mutually. Uncorrelated. N of same variance. So this is the meaning of this diagonal covariance matrix with equal elements. Sorry, it should be equal. 
equally is there. Diagonal covariance matrix with equal elements. So, this point we are considering diagonal covariance matrix with equal elements. That means the Fisher vector is mutually uncorrelated and of same variance. So, corresponding to this, my covariance matrix is sigma square i. i is the identity matrix. So, it is a d dimensional identity matrix. So, corresponding to this from the equation number 3, the equation number 3 I can write like this g i x is equal to 1 by sigma square mu i transpose x plus w i naught. So, I can write like this. Since uh, the one point you should remember sigma inverse is nothing but 1 by sigma square sigma whole square sigma square and i is the identity matrix I can write like this. So, equation number 3 I can write like this. So, what about the decision hyperplanes? Decision hyperplanes g i j x is equal to g i x minus g j x and that is equal to w transpose x minus x naught that is equal to 0. So, this is the equation of the decision boundary. Okay. Suppose w transpose x 1 plus w naught this w transpose x 1 plus w naught I can say is equal to suppose w transpose x 2 plus w naught. So, w naught. So, from this I can write w transpose x 1 minus x 2 is equal to 0. Actually, I am applying this to get this one. I am applying this to get this one. So, you can see I am getting the equation of the decision hyperplanes and the weight vector is nothing but the weight vector is nothing but the difference between these two means mu i and mu j. The weight vector is nothing but the difference between these two means. And also what is x naught? x naught is a point actually. x naught is nothing but 1 by 2 mu i plus mu j minus sigma square ln mu i minus mu j so this is x naught so these are very important these two equations are very important one is i have determined the expression for the decision hyperplanes that is g i z and another one is the x naught so this decision surfaces decision surface is a hyperplane passing through the point passing through the point passing through the point what is the point the point is x naught passing through the point x naught. So, these two equations one is the equation of the decision hyperplane. So, maybe I can change my color of the ink. So, this equation this is the equation for the decision hyperplane and also we are considering the x naught. x naught uh, is a point through which the hyperplane is passing. So, these two equations are very important one is the, the equation of the decision hyperplane and another one is the x naught that is the decision surface is a hyperplane passing through the point the point is x naught. Okay. So, now I want to determine what will be the decision boundary. So, let us move to the next slide. 
So, we obtain these two equations z i j x that is the decision hyperplane that is nothing but w transpose x minus x naught. So, this is the important equation, this is the equation of the decision hyperplane. And what is the weight vector? The weight vector is nothing but the difference between these two means mu i n mu j and what is x naught? x naught is the point through which the hyperplane is passing. So, this is mu i plus mu j minus sigma square ln So, we have these two important equations. One is the equation of the decision hyperplane and another one is x naught. And uh, one important point is the weight vector is this. This is the equation of the weight vector. That is nothing but the difference between these two means. Now, suppose one condition I am considering. Suppose this prior probabilities, probability of omega i is equal to probability of omega j. So, corresponding to this condition, what will be the decision boundary? So, if I consider this case, then x naught is equal to 1 by 2 mu i plus mu j. So, x naught will be like this. So, the vector x naught is 1 by 2 mu i plus mu j. That is the expression for this. Then the hyperplane, the meaning is actually the meaning of this. What is the meaning of this? The meaning is the hyperplane passes through the mean the mean of mu i and mu j. So, that is the meaning of this because I am taking the average of this 1 by 2 mu i plus mu j. So, hyperplane passes through the mean of mu i and mu j corresponding to the case. The case is if the probability of omega i is equal to probability of omega j. And one important sentence I can write that important sentence is the important statement is hyperplane is orthogonal to the vector. w that is mu i minus mu j. So, the w is the weight vector. So, from this expression you can see because w transpose dot x minus x naught. So, I have to put d here x naught is a vector w transpose x minus x naught is equal to 0 that is the meaning is. So, from this expression actually from this expression I can write like this the hyper plane is orthogonal to the vector. The vector is the weight vector and that is nothing but the difference between these two means. So, this is the important consideration. So, always you have to follow this one that hyperplane is orthogonal to the weight vector and that is the difference between the means mu i and mu j. Now, let us consider the case. If I consider So, suppose the probability of omega i is less than omega j. The meaning is the hyperplane, the hyperplane is located closer to closer to the mean mu i. So, that means if the probability of omega i is less than probability of omega j then hyperplane is located closer to mu i that is it is located closer to the cluster corresponding to the class omega i. So, I have suppose two clusters one is the cluster corresponding to the first class omega i and another cluster corresponding to the class omega j. So, corresponding to the first cluster omega i 
the mean is mu i. So, if I consider this case the probability of omega i less than probability of omega j, then the decision boundary will be located closer to the first cluster that is closer to the mean of the first cluster. Similarly, if I consider probability of omega i greater than probability of omega j this second condition, then the same thing will be applicable the hyperplane is located closer to mu j that means we have to consider the second cluster. So, the hyperplane or the decision boundary will be located closer to the second cluster corresponding to the class omega j and if this variance sigma square is small with respect to with respect to the difference between these two means the distance between the two means and we are considering the Euclidean norm the location of the hyperplane location of the hyperplane is rather insensitive to the values of these two prior probabilities probability of omega i and probability of omega z. So, that means the sigma square that is the variance is small with respect to the difference between these two means the location of the hyperplane is insensitive to the values of these two probabilities. The, what is the meaning of this uh, variance? The variance is small. The small variance I can say what is the meaning of small variance? And small variance means uh, random vectors random vectors are clustered within a small radius around their mean values. So, random vectors are clustered within a small radius around their mean values. So, that means it is nothing but the compact clusters the clusters are very compact, compact clusters. So, if I consider small variance the random vectors are clustered within a small radius around their mean values. So, that means the compact clusters. For the compact clusters the location of the hyperplane is insensitive to the values of the probability, probability of omega i and probability of omega j that means the meaning is for the compact cluster you have sufficient independence or sufficient freedom to place the decision boundary between the classes. That means it is easy to place the decision boundary between the classes for the compact clusters. So, now let us see how to get the decision boundary based on these conditions. So, one condition already I have explained that is the hyperplane is orthogonal to the weight vector. So, this first condition is very important and second condition is the hyperplane will pass through the point the point is x naught. So, second point is x naught. So, already we have uh, derived the equation for x naught. So, based on these two conditions let us draw the decision boundary between the classes. So, let us move to the next slide. So, I am drawing this decision boundary. So, suppose we are considering this this feature space and two features x1 and x2 suppose. Now, let us consider this is the mean the mean is mu i corresponding to the class I have two classes the two classes are omega i and omega j. So, these two classes we are considering and another mean we are considering suppose this is the mean 
of the second class. So, it is mu j. Now, I want to determine the difference between these two means. The difference between these two means is this. So, this is the difference between these two means that is nothing but this vector is mu i minus mu j and that is nothing but the weight vector that is nothing but the weight vector mu i minus mu j is nothing but the weight vector and after this I am considering another vector that vector is x naught. So, we have derived the equation for x naught. Now, how to draw the decision boundary? So, I have to draw the decision boundary. The decision boundary should be orthogonal to the weight vector and it should pass through the point, the point is x naught. So, this is my decision boundary, this is the decision boundary and you can see it is orthogonal to the weight vector, it is orthogonal to the weight vector, weight vector is nothing but the difference between mu i and mu j. So, this is I can say as decision boundary. between these two classes and in this case you can see the decision boundary is orthogonal to the weight vector and it passes through the point x naught. So, in this case we have considered uh, that covariance matrix is sigma square i. So, already I have explained that the diagonal covariance matrix with equal elements that means the Fisher vector is mutually uncorrelated and has uh, same variance. So, I is the identity matrix. So, this is the procedure to draw the uh, decision boundary. Now, let us consider that is we have considered that variance is very small is small with respect to with respect to this difference between these two means. So, this is nothing but the compact clusters. So, for the compact clusters what will be the decision boundary? So, let us draw the decision boundary for the compact clusters. The procedure is same, same procedure we have to apply. So, x1 and x2. So, we are considering the Fisher space and first I am considering this vector that is nothing but the mu i and we are considering this is the cluster and another is cluster and that is suppose the cluster is something like this and this is the mu j, one is mu i and another is mu j. This is mu i and mu j and that is corresponding to the class omega i and this is the class omega j. So, these are compact clusters. So, the procedure is this. So, I have to determine the weight vector. The weight vector I can determine that is nothing but the difference between these two means. So, this is the weight vector. So, this is weight vector is w and that is the nothing but the difference between mu i and mu j. After this we are considering the point, the point is x naught, this is the x naught and after this I have to draw the uh, decision boundary that is the bisector I have to show. So, this decision boundary will be perpendicular or the orthogonal to the weight vector and it is passing through the point, the point is x naught. So, this is for the compact case, compact case. So, you can see it is easy to place the decision boundary between the classes. So, these are the compact clusters and actually the compact means samples with high probability. So, if the samples with high probability, then I will be getting the compact clusters. samples with high probability means it is a compact clusters. So, for the non-compact uh, clusters uh, it is very difficult to place the decision boundary. So, I can uh, show that one also pictorially. So, the same procedure. So, this is suppose one cluster and suppose this is another cluster. So, corresponding to the first cluster I have the mean the mean is mu i and corresponding to the second cluster I have the mean mu j and we can find 
we can find the weight vector the procedure is same so this is the weight vector and the point also we have to show the point is x naught so this is x naught now i have to draw the decision boundary now this is the decision boundary that is also orthogonal to the weight vector and it is passing through the point x naught so this case is the non compact case this is a non compact case so in the non compact case the location of decision hyperplane is much more critical it is very difficult to place the decision boundary between the classes that means the location of the decision hyperplane is much more critical as compared to the compact case so uh, this is the procedure how to get the decision boundary between the classes how to find the location of the decision boundary between the classes so first point you have to remember that the decision boundary should be orthogonal to the weight vector the weight vector is w and that is the difference between these two means mu i and mu j the second point is the decision boundary should be passing through the point the point is x not this is for case number 1 in case number 2 in case number 2 uh, we will be considering the covariance matrix is not diagonal the covariance matrix is same for all the classes but it is not a diagonal covariance matrix in case number 1 we consider the diagonal covariance matrix so this case number 2 i will be discussing in my next class so what is the decision boundary for the non diagonal covariance matrix so that we have to discuss and after this i will discuss the minimum distance classifiers based on euclidean distance and based on mohalanovic distance so in this class i discuss the concept of the bayesian decision theory i have explained the concept how we can determine the decision boundary between the classes i have considered that the class conditional density that is the probability of x given omega i it follows the normal distribution and based on this i have determined the expression for the discriminate function after determining the expression for the discriminate function i want to determine the hyperplanes or the decision boundary between the classes so in the case number 1 i have considered the diagonal covariance matrix for the diagonal covariance matrix the decision boundary will be passing through the point point is x not and also the decision boundary is orthogonal to the weight vector the weight vector is w the weight vector is nothing but the difference between the mean mu i and mu j so based on these two conditions the first condition is the decision boundary should be orthogonal to the vector the vector is the weight vector and it should pass through the point the point is x not this is for case number 1 the case number 1 is the covariance matrix is same for all the classes and we are considering the diagonal covariance matrix in the next class i will be considering the case number 2 in case number 2 we are considering the covariance matrix is same for all the classes but it is a non diagonal covariance matrix so for this i have to determine the location of the decision hyperplane and how to determine the decision hyperplanes and the decision boundary so that concept i will be explaining in my next class so let me stop here today thank you mm -hmm.